Okay, afternoon everyone. Um, thanks for joining for another Think In. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Kat Nealon. I'm the political editor here at Tortoise. And today we are going to be talking about what do the Tories do now? Um, which sort of seems like a fairly simple question, but I think has been um, dividing them and uh, we kind of have to go along for the ride until they've figured it out. Um, so obviously the Conservatives have gone through a huge period of turmoil. Um, we're on our third prime minister in a year. Um, we've had a sort of kind of across the the sort of gamut of uh, views on what uh, we should do in terms of the economy, what we should do in terms of sort of social um, sort of philosophy. And, um, and now it kind of feels as though even before uh, they are out of power, um, conservative MPs and thinkers are already trying to sort of plan what they should be doing next. Um, but actually, I think the bigger question and the reason why we're saying this is because it's what they should do now that's important. Um, and I will sort of talk a bit more about um, uh, some polling that uh, for an event I went to this morning that shows that actually um, there is still a world in which there could be a hung parliament. And so it's not necessarily the case that Labour is going to be the next government. Um, so the um, polling has been fairly consistent. Uh, Labour has had a double digit, a strong, healthy double digit lead. Uh, and the sort of moment that that kind of crossed over was actually uh, December, 2021 when um, the Owen Patterson scandal happened. I don't know if you guys remember that, but it was around unpaid lobbying. He was found to have um, uh, sort of engaged in, in unpaid um, lobbying and was uh, supposed to be suspended. Boris Johnson then tried to circumvent that um, and it caused a huge row internally. Um, and then not long after that was kind of the start of the Partygate saga which then ran for several months. There was a vote of no confidence, which, which Boris Johnson actually won. Um, Partygate didn't end, uh, but the thing that ultimately did for him was the Chris Pincher affair, which again, we're still sort of seeing uh, this kind of issue around uh, sexual misconduct play out uh, in Westminster throughout all the parties, um, but the does seem to be a lot of Conservative MPs that that, that applies to. Um, after Boris, we had the first leadership contest where we saw, I think, uh, some of the names that could become future uh, leader contenders. Um, people like Suella Braveman, Kemi Badnock, Penny Mordaunt, and of course, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. Um, and then we kind of all know how that ended. And uh, and then we ended up with our third prime minister, Rishi Sunak, who has been sort of trying to rebuild things, stabilize things, give off this kind of air of uh, a sort of quiet competence. And along with his chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who is very much in the same kind of mold, um, sort of try to, I was just chatting to some of my colleagues uh, outside, trying to get the economy, which is the kind of real focus of their work, uh, trying to get that back into as good a place as it can be ahead of the next election. And so the election is kind of, you know, being pushed back to the latest possible moment in order to allow the economy time to rebuild as much as possible. Um, now, John Curtis, who is a very well-respected pollster, Sophologist has said that um, there has never been an instance where a government has um, presided over a financial crisis and then gone on to win the next election. So this is kind of where the sort of thinking is that um, it's all baked in. Rishi Sunak will uh, effectively bow out at the next election. Um, and it's just a case of sort of damage limitation. 
Um, but a lot of conservative MPs um, do sort of point to the fact that Labour's lead in the poll is very soft. And this is kind of borne out again by um, some of the findings of this uh, poll uh, that I was briefed on this morning. Um, that there is not a huge sort of passionate movement behind uh, Keir Starmer, uh, but neither is there a huge passionate movement behind Rishi Sunak. Um, and so uh, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, I went to two different conferences um, about the future of conservatism, although they weren't necessarily billed as that. One was called the Conservative Democratic Organization, which is funded by Lord Crudders, Peter Crudders, um, who is a, a huge Boris fan. And many of the speakers and I would say all of the delegates were Boris fans. So that is, he's the kind of we can't quit you type component of the Conservative Party. There is a... a I would say it's a minority, but um, it's a fairly significant minority of Conservative members and some MPs who still very much believe that Boris Johnson is the solution to the problems. And then later that same week, I went to the NatCon conference, which was very, very different in tone. So the CDO conference felt like your typical... British political get together. It was at a seaside town. It was in Bournemouth. Um, it was um, a small sort of group of politically interested uh, party members um, who were not hugely diverse, either in ethnicity or age or financial background or any of the sort of metrics that you might um, want to uh, judge diversity by. Um, the NatCon conference um, was held in a church, which I think is quite telling. Uh, there were distinct religious overtones to the whole thing. Um, and of course, it was organized by an American think tank. And so that felt very much to me like an attempt at trying to import American style conservatism to the UK, which I don't really think will succeed. Um, I think that as a nation, we are quite used to having um, a sort of distinction between our sort of personal uh, and social uh, beliefs, um, religious or otherwise, and the sort of political sphere. And it felt like it was trying to do something that I, 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 don't, I don't think will get huge amounts of momentum behind it here. Um, yes. Just on, so on the one, yeah. is it, so are you saying it's less of a shop window for kind of what the Conservative Party stands for, or is it people trying to influence what the Conservative Party should stand for? I'm trying to work out like what the... Yeah, it felt like they were trying to make it happen. Right. And obviously they did have some big name speakers, Swella Braveman and, and Michael Gove. Um, I, I get the impression from speaking to members of Gove's team that perhaps in hindsight, they, you know, I mean, they were perfectly happy with what he said. He said what he believes in, um, but I, I don't necessarily know whether they would do that again. Whereas um, Suella's speech felt very much like a kind of pitch for leadership. Um, and uh, I, I think she would probably be quite happy doing that again. Um, and the more interesting um, speeches actually came from MPs who are less well known, Danny Kruger, who uh, more might be more well known as the son of Prue Leith, and um, Miriam Cates, uh, who who both talked about sort of socially conservative family values type things, you know, the quote normative family, and um, sort of yeah, socially conservative issues. Which then, when I was speaking to um, conservative MPs, even those on the right of the party were saying that just doesn't wash anymore, um, pr primarily because we will end up looking like hypocrites. I think the exact quote was, you can guarantee that if you start talking about family values the week after, someone will be caught with their trousers down. So, you know, there is a sort of <laughs> uh, scepticism as to whether that's the right approach because they know that their house is not completely in order. 
but also because I just don't think that that's what a majority of the population want. Um, and so I'm just going to turn to some of the some of the polling um, from this morning, which was um, it's the so MRP. I'm uh, not going to tell you what that stands for because I can't remember, but um, it's uh, it's the sort of new ish fangled way of polling that has been much more accurate than some of the kind of more traditional polling and correctly uh, called um, uh, the more recent elections, um, including, I think, um, what someone was saying this morning, they um, estimated that uh, the Conservatives would end up with an 81-seat majority in 2019, and they ended up with an 80-seat majority. So it's pretty accurate. Um, and they are saying here, now they've got a sort of range of, of possible outcomes, um, the sort of for, as far as Labour is concerned, the best case scenario would be that they could win 470 seats, which would be a huge landslide. That's a 140 seat majority. But um, there are a few things that might affect that. So one of them is if reform, which is currently led by Richard Tice, but Nigel Farage has talked about making a comeback, if they stand aside that could actually whittle down Labour's lead to 401 and give, give the Conservatives 201 seats. Um, so uh, already you can see kind of a shift there. And then when you kind of allow for uh, a sort of uh, overlay of uh, demographics, it actually could end up in a hung parliament um, so Labour with 316 seats and the Conservatives with 286 seats. And the phrase that they kept using was that Labour is currently winning by default um, because people are angry or annoyed with the Conservatives. And in Scotland, uh, there is a sort of post-Sturgeon uh, factor. Uh, people feel very... Um, I think the, the, they were saying that it's almost like a loss, like a, you know, they've they've lost this person that they, a leader that they really believed in. And so Labour is sort of winning by default. But actually in the sort of next year to 18 months of campaigning, and if the economy does improve, then there will be sort of more reasons for people to vote for the Conservatives. Um, so it is, it is a soft uh, uh, leader ship um it is a soft lead sorry um and i i just wanted to sort of pick up on some of the uh kind of slightly interesting comments that they made um so um this was from focus groups um they described um rishi sunak as little rishi which made me laugh he is taller than me um but you know let's not judge um, and uh, but also described Keir Starmer as being a bit meh. And the other thing which um, I used to run some focus groups myself and I also picked up on is this idea that Keir Starmer is somehow part of the aristocracy because he's a sir and therefore he's not really one of us, which is kind of what Boris Johnson was trying to do a lot by calling him Sir Keir all the time and you can see Rishi doing that with Sir Softy and so on so they're sort of you know obviously they they are fully aware of Labour's weaknesses and are and are pushing them um so John Curtis described um Sunak Starmer and Ed Davey who is the leader of the Liberal Democrats as he said, we're in a peculiar moment where none of the three political leaders are seemingly capable of articulating a vision of the country they want to create by 2030. And said that that creates a vacuum for Boris Johnson to come back. And um, so, again, I think that this is a period in which because we don't have someone who is out there saying, vote for me, this is what I will do, I will change this, I will make this better for you, that people are, there's no kind of strong conviction behind any one of the parties at the minute or any one of the leaders. Um, and um, Luke Trill from More In Common, he said that um, the party who will win is the one that can best convince people they can switch on the six, six o'clock news and not be scared. 
because people are so exhausted by the news and so sort of fed up. And this idea that everything is broken is so sort of prevalent. Um, now we know, oh, and, and actually another uh, good quote uh, from Luke Trill um, in terms of after Rishi Sunak, assuming they do lose, um, is about which leader they would pick. And a lot of focus has obviously been on Suella Braveman. Uh, but he says in terms of the focus group uh, responses, she would be, quote, the longest suicide note in history. Um, so, uh, because she's so polarizing, whereas Penny Mordaunt and Kemi, Kemi Badnock both test well in focus groups because they're seen as authentic. And obviously Penny Mordaunt had a bit of a bounce after the coronation because she was holding the sword. Um, uh, well, I mean, look, has anyone here held a sword for two hours? I haven't. Um, and um, Kemi Badenoch, I mean, they are both Brexiteers, which I think is quite interesting that that is still something that the Conservatives would look for in a leader. Um, but um, Kemi Badenoch has, has annoyed uh, the ERG quite a lot with um, her sort of quite high-handed way of, of responding to them about the retained EU bill. Um, so, but as people who have listened to the ERG podcast will know, they are not quite the force that they once were. So Rishi Sunak has these five pledges and um, they are to halve inflation, uh, I've forgotten what they are now. That's good. Halve inflation, uh, grow the economy, stop the boats. Um, and I'll find the others. But even on those three, um, it's now looking increasingly... When he first set those pledges out, the view was, well, they're very easy. You know, grow the economy didn't even put a figure on it. It was just to grow it a bit. <clears throat> halve the inf halve inflation everyone thought well that's you know it will just halve you know the economy can't keep you know inflation can't keep growing uh at this rate it will halve anyway and i think that's what the sort of um imf slash bank of england had been forecasting um oh debt falling cut the nhs waiting lists and stop uh small boats or pass new laws to stop small boats but increasingly, um, the, the view is that um, he won't achieve any of these um, and that will be a real problem for him. Um, and I think this kind of then comes back to what will conservative MPs do? Um, it all kicked off again <clears throat> last week when uh, the story broke about uh, the cabinet office passing on the details of uh, from Boris Johnson's uh, diaries of uh, potentially lockdown breaking parties that took place in Chequers. Um, that went down very badly with Boris supporters, not unsurprisingly, um, who immediately started talking about letters of no confidence going in and, you know, it could be the thing that kind of upends Rishi Sunak's leadership. So um, the fact is that he is uh, walking on eggshells with his party. He knows that the support for him is very shallow, um, uh, whereas the support for Boris Johnson, although is narrow, is very deep. So those who do like Boris Johnson will die for him and those who do like Rishi Sunak might not cross the road for him. So that question about Boris and, mm. and his depth and narrowness of his support, you're saying that Curtis said this morning that there's a, an opening for him. If he, it, let's just suppose that there was another Tory um, eruption and they changed leader before the, the, the suggestion is that this is a vacuum that he might use before the next election, right? Does that, uh, and that might galvanize his base, that would galvanize his base within the party, but would it not also galvanize um, non-Tory voters against the Tories and, and widen the national gap that is... Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that it's even something that people 
ask about shows how bad things are for the party, that they don't have, you know, that they basically, they haven't put this to bed. Um, and, you know, you still get, you do still get people saying, well, he could come back. They say the wider public don't really care. And that is kind of borne out by some polling that, that they, because people don't pay as much attention to what's happening as people that are political obsessives. I think that probably it is incredibly unlikely that they would change at this stage. But there is a logic to change the leader, isn't there? Because they're looking at losing under Sunak, so yeah. why not change? Yeah. Why not try something else? Mm. And and they happen to have a, an election winner um, in the shadows. Go on. I, I mean, I think they're looking at losing under anybody. That, that's 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 why the question is interesting because I think th there's no plausible scenario where even they, I think, the ones I've talked to, think they can win the next election. Because the, ec the economic track record is terrible. Inflation is really, really stubborn. That's a problem from that sense of brokenness is a real weight around their neck. So I don't think even, even the most optimistic conservatives think they're going to win this thing. And that, that's the frame for the decision they're going to take. And so what's, what's the, so they're looking you know, to recovery, repair, a future beyond the next election. And in that, I don't think, I'm not sure that Boris features in in that Boris is a, you know, is a, a arguably a short-term card you'd play if you were mad enough to think you can win the next election. But if you're, but if you're interested beyond that, you're not going to go there, are you? I think I think Boris is probably a card you play to kind of force Rishi to do things rather than a, something that is a serious um, possibility. And I mean, we've talked before about. Um, I don't even think he's actually going to stand. I mean, well, this is this, increasingly, this is the view from people that I speak to is that it's not a case of will he stand in <clears throat> Uxbridge or will he stand in Henley? Um, increasingly, people are of the view he's not going to stand at all. Um, now, I think he is, as many of them are, a sort of pragmatist that will hold off making that decision until the, the absolute latest minute. Um, to the point about most of them thinking they are going to lose, I think you can look and see how many of them have said they're going to stand down as a kind of indication of the fact that they they, they see the writing is on the wall. But that said, Starmer is not Blair and the momentum behind him is not 97 New Labour style. Um, so, and, and the... Um, the majority that the Conservatives have at the minute is such that even with a huge swing, you could still end up in a territory where it is a hung parliament or a very small majority, in which case, as you say, it is about how long are they in opposition? Is it a couple of years and then it collapses? Is it five years? Is it two terms? Mm. These are all kind of decisions that they, or, or sort of possibilities that they are sort of war gaming. And I think a lot will depend on who they pick as their post Rishi leader as to how long they'll spend in the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. Just on that sort of question of like how long they sort of stay in opposition, what is the general mood that sort of, you know, they're resigned to it, but maybe it's a good thing they sort of, they feel they can get the house in order and sort of be back before 2030, or a lot of them terrified that. If they lose, the party will tear themselves apart and they're sort of looking down the barrel of, which is why so many of them are sort of standing down, maybe. Well, there's no real consensus. And this is this is the problem, right? There, there is no one sort of conservative MP that kind of speaks for the whole party because you've got the red wallers, you've got the blue wallers, you've got people that have been there for a while, you've got people who are just starting. Um, and so there is kind of confusion and a huge disagreement about what direction they should go in. Um, I think that, you know, the sort of Trussites are, are sort of making a, um, a, a sort of big shout about the need to cut taxes. Um, but I don't think that they are sort of a serious proposition in terms of the internal politics. I think that, you know, you can tell by the fact that Rishi Sunak has kept Suella Braverman on for as long as he has done, albeit, you know, uh, apparently not not with any great enthusiasm, um, that he sees that the sort of immigration issue is kind of a big one. So if they sort of pivot more towards that in the post uh, Rishi era, um, you could, uh, I mean, I, 
I think it will it will sort of send the party in one of two ways, right? Either they will have to lean, they cannot, sorry, let me get my words straight. The 2019 election result created a very, very unusual coalition of voters, coalition of conservative voters. You would not normally expect to have the sort of socially conservative, but economically kind of left wing red wall voters in the same party as the socially liberal, but small state voters of the sort of, you know, the typical Tory core. Um, and I don't think there's any hope of maintaining either of those. In fact, I think it's probably quite likely they will lose significant support from both of those. The question is, do you try and appeal to, which one do you try to appeal to? Um, Rishi Sunak would sort of seem to naturally lend himself more towards the sort of blue wall. Um, but, uh, the scrap will be over um, whether they go red wall or go blue wall, I think, and ultimately. And I think, you know, if you see a world in which people are sort of saying, well, it could be Suella, Kemi, maybe Penny Mordaunt versus, say, James Cleverly, um, then, you know, it, what is interesting is that because the One Nations haven't really spoken up very much, the One Nations are the sort of moderate, centrist um they they are not talking about their vision for the future of the party because their guy is the prime minister so what we're hearing is the sort of fighting on the right and the sort of scrapping for the future of the party on the right we're not hearing anyone articulate the future of the party on the left and so that is a bit of a vacuum and it makes it seem as though it's more likely that the Conservatives will lurch to the right, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. You think the membership will just take them to the right because there's not there's not a left-wing view? Yeah, the problem with Luke Trill's view and the focus groups is that it doesn't take any, any account of who's going to vote in. And actually, but the membership they, are going to be a lot keener on Suella Braverman than, yeah. than Luke Trill and his focus groups. And are. the problem is, I guess, it's the sort of Corbyn dilemma right if you if you allow yourself to be kind of co-opted by the members well actually the vast majority of voters of of you know of any persuasion do not think like the members of any persuasion you know they're always more extreme they're more extreme than MPs and they're more extreme than voters so I mean if if the members sort of dictate who the leader will be which seems likely um unless you just manage to get into a two-horse race for you know um uh, then we could be in a sort of period where they are out of the Conservatives are in opposition for for a long time because you know they will just be beyond the pale for most people. Um, so I'm just obviously like in, I've got memories of 2016 slightly I guess, but how much and something you noted from the conferences was this kind of American kind of slide at least and not and not just on culture war and kind of the religious front and, and those kind of arguments and how much those kind of events running in Tamden, we're going to have Trump being indicted while he's running in primaries and whether or not they're going to be looking that side and going, can we learn something here in terms of how we move? Is that something that is happening or, or in Europe as well? The, is there kind of other patterns that we can associate outside of the UK? Um, I mean, I think they're all quite distinct, but you can, it's probably more a function of um, uh, voters feeling that they're not being listened to and e economic problems um, that kind of result in a sort of protest vote of some kind. Um, but, you know, immigration had really dropped off the list of salient issues until Suella Braverman started talking about the invasion of immigrants. Mm. And um, and so actually, you know, most people were more worried about NHS, public services, being able to get to work, being able to pay the bills. And all of a sudden this issue kind of popped up and then it kind of surges for a bit. Um, I think the view from within the party is that she has created a headache for them because they're not going to be able to solve that. You know, yeah. I mean, it's taken successive governments however many years and you kind of, it's a bit of a whack-a-mole, isn't it? Because you, pardon me, you stop immigrants um, sort of uh, getting the lorries um, or, you know, yeah. and then they're 
getting small boats and then you know i mean and now this is a huge huge problem that with sort of miles of coastline and and kind of you know how do they solve it it's 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 going to be it's it's going to be a very difficult one for them to you cannot just build a wall (laughs) um so um so i think that in terms of sort of immigration as an issue it's uh it's not from speaking to sort of mps and speaking to uh sort of pollsters and focus groups people and things like that it's not the issue that people had or have front of mind. The mm. issue that people are worried about right now is the, the economy. Um, and so, you know, when interest rates are still going up, inflation is still going up, um, and there is sort of uncertainty in the market, that will be that will sort of take precedence. The way that then immigration could become an issue is things like housing and services and so on and so forth. If people start to see that kind of having a real world impact um, on their lives. Um, but it, but it, but it hadn't been. Mm. Um, so, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for doing that like twenty-five minute uninterrupted bit at the beginning where you rattle through. No, because it was interesting because it made me think there are so many things that keep happening, like weird incidences, bits of scandal, bits of you know corruption, whatever, and. If we're thinking about, we're about the stories behind the story and sort of avoiding some of the noise, what do you think are some of the things that either taught us or generally have over-reported on? And are there things that we that have been under-reported on that need further investigation? Like, were there incidents that were kind of glossed over or were there things that were kind of made too much of just because, I don't know, it might have been a quiet news week or something? Or are there things that deserve going back and revisiting now the dust has settled a bit? Um, because just it's just like a never-ending catalogue of bizarre incidents, basically, for like the last three years. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, journalists in general uh, focus on the people rather than the policies. And I think that's that's the problem is that we spend far more time talking about Boris Johnson than we do about what he maybe was trying to do with leveling up or, you know, housing or the NHS and so on and so forth. You know, so I think I think probably we all need to sort of think about what um, what do people really care about and not to be sort of caught up in the circus. And it's really difficult because that's exciting and interesting and the personalities are quite fun at times and it has been a particularly crazy period um where the personalities have mattered because they have dictated things like Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng their personal view of the world has had a real world impact on everyone's finances um so so it, you can't always separate the two but I think we need to sort of be able to drill down into what's actually going on. Um, and also, I think probably, and this will naturally happen now that Labour is more of a, a, a viable prospect as the future government, is to, to really interrogate what they're doing and how different it is um, when it comes to their suggestions for the future. But is there a thing that you think, actually, we should probably go back and have a look at that? Or I didn't um, need to put you on the spot. Well, you know, I I do I think housing is is the the sort of he, sort of defining issue of of our time um, because it is the thing that Tory strategists worry about. Like they know that the um, sort of the fact that people are getting older before they become homeowners will have a real existential bearing on their party. Um, and of course, you know, we all, you know, know people who, if you're renting, your rent has gone up astronomically in the last year or so because you don't have any control over that. Um, and interest rates mean that mortgage owners, they're, they're paying more. So, so it's sort of, it's that kind of really sort of tangible thing for most people. Um, but it's something which, again, doesn't seem to have had any kind of real sort of uh, interrogation and kind of proper solutions coming out of it, um, and 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 partly that is because the party and the country are divided on whether we should be building more or whether we should be protecting spaces 
Um, so I think that, uh, but then also, you know, I think the sort of post Brexit, um, what is Britain doing? <laughs> like we can't have a sort of vibrant economy without having it, good sort of industry sectors, exports and so on. So I think, you know, where is the sort of um, big picture sort of 20 year thinking coming from in terms of making the UK a vibrant country again? Mm -hmm. uh, this is The Economist. Um, so I have a, a Scotland question. How many, imagine a 10 to 14 point spread on election day, or maybe a bit softer, 8 to 14 point. How many seats does Labour have to take off the SNP to get an overall majority? That's question one. <laughs> no, but isn't that, uh, I, I was hearing that unless unless there's a, a seismic change in the apportionment of seats in Scotland, then despite this big poll lead, Labour's still looking, as you, as you say, at a, 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 a plurality, but not, a, not an overall majority. Yeah, Scotland is definitely the, the, probably the key battleground. Um, I th so at the minute they've got one MP, I think. Yeah. And the Tories have got six. So um, it's a very low base. And you would expect them to, to go up quite significantly from that. Um, I think Anna Sawa has been making some sort of good, um, uh, gaining some ground. But again, he's not a hugely inspirational person. And, um, you know, we in Scotland, you know, regardless of your personal views of them, Alex Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon were both very inspiring charismatic individuals so that there is a kind of a problem at the minute in Scotland as in England where you know you've kind of lost some of the sort of sparky individuals that people will really rally behind and I do think you could probably see a sort of lower turnout electorally because people are fed up with it all and just mm. have no positive reason to vote um, but I think some uh, they're sort of estimating around 30, 31 seats in Scotland for, for Labour at the minute, so. That, that's like two thirds, right? Or yeah. Three fifths? Yeah. Wow. That, but so that's huge. Then so Labour, Conservative Labour people think they'll win 15 in Scotland. 31 would be a real triumph, wouldn't it? Because you're right, Charles, without, without Scotland to get an overall majority, the, Tor the Labour has to win Jacob rees seat to seat to, win in, to yeah. win in England alone. So that does look like a really uphill thing. I guess the question is whether the mood in Scotland lasts for the next year and a half. Yeah. Or whether it's you know, being driven by... Which will more probably be more um, sort of caused by what happens with the SNP rather than necessarily mm. what happens with Labour or Conservatives. Um, but I think, you know, obviously, if you're an ex-SNP voter... Um, I mean, there's nothing to say you couldn't then go to, to the Greens, for argument's sake, because some of these smaller... Um, pro-independence parties are sort of gaining more ground. So it's not necessarily um, that Labour will pick up all of these seats, but I, maybe that's the best case scenario is 31. Um, but that's sort of, yeah, obviously they're kind of hoping. And I think, they, you know, we would see, Starmer's been up there quite a bit already. Mm. I would expect to see him really kind of going hard in that particular area. Speaking of Starmer, are we allowed to talk about Labour briefly, even though this is all about the Tories? Yeah. Um, to your point about uh, policy versus personalities, Starmer is boring. Yeah. Rachel Reeves is boring snoring, officially. Right, yeah. she's not kicked that. Uh, Sunak is boring. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be a boring election from a personality point of view. Mm. Does that mean that it might be uh, an interesting election from a policy point of view? And is that, in fact, what, what Starmer is counting on, that he will... Not that he's really done it yet, but lay out, uh, uh, make the electorate an offer it can't refuse in policy terms. Uh, I think probably it feels to me like all the leaders at the minute are kind of placeholders. Mm. And we will, you know, see a sort of next generation kind of come up behind them. So the kind of on, on, on Labour side, West Streeting, you know, I know that Andy Burnham isn't in uh, Westminster, but, you know, he 
he carries a lot of sway and you know could he kind of help to bolster it so it may be more of a sort of team sport rather than a kind of leader um and and as already discussed with the conservatives you've got you know the kind of next guard already sort of very much kind of fighting for it who are they sweller braveman oh, kemi badnock yeah, yeah, yeah penny morden etc etc james cleverly um so um i think uh we will always find ourselves more willing to write about the personalities rather than policies. Poli policies are kind of boring in and of themselves, unless you get something that you feel is going to make a real clear difference. And, the and unless we underestimate the voters. I mean, we've had a belly full of personalities. This is why I, your, what you say about housing, maybe that's the kind of thing that, that actually in the end is, is, is going to decide the next election. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think... I, I don't know, maybe I'm, um, I kind of find things like the, the sort of green energy policy quite boring. Um, you know, I can't get that excited about a lot of the things that are kind of, I think probably are important, um, but it's not, they're not dial changing policies. I'm yet to see anything that I've thought, wow, that's a real moment. And, and, you know, look, I'm a part of the electorate just as much as I'm a, um, I'm a reporter. So I think that, you know, when you look at the sort of real sort of paradigm shifts in politics, whether it's sort of, yes, we can, or, um, you know, things can only get better or, get Brexit done, you know, it's, it's, it's message is always boiled down into something very simple and it's about change in some way. Um, and it's, and it's usually change for a positive thing. I mean, you know, you can kind of have a personal dislike of Brexit, but for people who believed in Brexit, that was positive. Right. So, um, there is nothing, there is no sort of what you would call like a retail offer that can be distilled into something really simple for people. Like the Corbyn manifesto was so over the top, like really, really too long. People can't digest that much. You need to have something that's simple that they can kind of take away and kind of think, I know what this guy is, stands for, or woman would be nice. Um, I know what this person stands for and I will sort of, you know, put my faith in them to be able to deliver it. And it, it doesn't feel like that at the minute. Can I, can I rebut you sli only slightly in that I think the, the moment I was like, oh, I can see this being the, one of the games for the next election is, is childcare, mm -hmm. because that was something that was not really in the sphere of, it was kind of sitting with campaigners like Jodie Brearley, and then suddenly it's in the budget, and then they kind of hop step Labour's own policy, which means that Labour's going to have to go further. And that was the only point I went, oh, like, I mean, it's still not good enough. There's still some issues in universal credit. Like, it's still not great policy, but it is much better in many ways. I mean, you can better talk to that than me. But, Unfortunately, um, I won't be benefiting from it because it's not coming in. But anyway. Um, <laughs> but, that, but it was long term and it was it felt like something. Is that a wrong idea about policies like that that were are? The, so no, um, and the, the, the problem that Labour does have is that whenever it does articulate clear new policies, then the Conservatives come along and nab that idea. Um, so you kind of, you know, they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. Mm. Um, and I think you're right. I think childcare was shaping up to be a big battleground, but that seems to have been slightly neutered by, by you know, by the budget. Yeah. Okay. And it's never been a... It's never been a high salience issue, even though you could argue it should be. It's, it's, it's never, it's never been in the top ten of things that people vote on. But then this, oh, is it this? This, I have I made up Stevenage woman or someone? No, no. Stevenage woman is a thing. Yeah, Stevenage woman. Who, yes. Is that would that then fit like childcare into that? So, so you know, so every kind of electoral cycle, we get these kind of Mondeo man. Um, Workington man, and this time around it's it's Stevenage woman, um, which uh, for those of you who haven't uh, seen it, is someone that basically isn't that interested in politics, um, wants their kids to you know do well and have more money, um, so it's basically like everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but the reason why they've sort of pinpointed Stevenage is because that is um, it's a 
one of those seats that is sort of defines the government. So if it's Tory, then it will be a Tory government. If it's Labour, it'll be a Labour, Labour government. Um, and it is quite far down the list of seats. The MP there, although he's standing down, seems, well, he says, you might question whether this is true given that he's standing down but he says um he he's confident that the conservatives will keep it because it's it's sort of 400th or something on the on the list of marginal seats but anyway the, the, it's always useful for strategists to kind of have an archetype voter that they're after and i think it is interesting that they are going after a woman this time yeah that was that was why i thought it was interesting yeah. anyone else yeah one more. I'm sorry, you can't. Sorry. Uh, from the C word to the L word to the E word, Europe. Yes. Okay, so not the B word, but last week um, Sunak went to Chisinau, Moldova. Yes. European political community. Macron's project, second meeting, mm. an outer circle. Uh, political rather than economic, outside the EU. When you talk to centrist uh, Tories, yeah. or do they s attach any significance at all to this as a project that they can talk about without sacrificing their reputations and their seats? And is it is it a glimmer of a way back into Europe? Um, or is it poisoned by association with Macron? I think uh, not by Macron, but just by the whole Brexit thing. I think people still feel um, shell shock from. Yeah, but, but, right? Every, so trust was right. We need growth, right? And it's freaking obvious where we're yeah. going to get growth from. So someone has got to find a way to talk about this. So, um, so I think basically, yes, um, there is obviously, um, and I think probably it will be more so after the next election, um, because a lot of the MPs that we have in at the minute are sort of of a time in which Brexit was very salient. I think after the next election, I think that's dying down. And I think after the next election, we will have more people for whom Brexit either is not a priority or they really are more sort of remain slash rejoin. Um, I think that people are scared to put their heads above the parapet on that because so many people have been shot down by it. But um, going back to this morning's briefing with John Curtis, he was talking about how um, the, the sort of... Um, importance of it has changed and and also kind of what it's doing to the sort of political allegiances so he said basically if you were a labor remainer you you are, are still a labor remainer if you were a tory remainer you might be a bit sort of wobbly if you were a tory lever you probably it's a it's less important or b you may have even changed your mind about whether you thought that leave was a good thing so um let me get my figures so he was saying that um currently polls now have 57 percent of people saying uh they want to rejoin and um the loyalty to um remain slash leave if you were if you were a remainer of any stripe 82 percent of people still who who were remainers are still remainers whereas 74 percent of people who were leavers are continue to be leavers so actually you are starting to see a shift and that doesn't allow for the number of people that are now able to vote who weren't in 2016 so that will also be sort of there there's a demographic trend that will at some point push towards rejoin it is um it is obviously stronger with labor than it is with the conservatives <clears throat> um i don't think that's gonna happen in this election but i think it will be i think people will feel more comfortable about being open about it by the next election I still think you're going to have to invest in a packet of readies because you're going to get an ulcer if you carry on like that. Because no one's going to talk about this in this election. Because this is our, this is our first proper post-Brexit election, isn't it? And people, you know, Starmer's not going to talk about it, the Tories aren't. Can you recommend a, 
over the counter. <laughs> I can. I can help you out. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Did you identify who made that garments? Which guy? Oh yeah, that was Gene Simmons is in, in the Commons. So there you go, watching the PMQs. Um, Rebecca? Um, no one is talking, no political party has got anything to offer young people. Is that because they're going to vote the way they're going to vote or because we have no hope? Oh, there is a Labour student I'm not a student. I don't oh. care about students. <laughs> um, I think I think this is the one of the problems that Labour has is that they are they're still sort of trying to win back the voters that they lost in 2019, and so um, they there is a sense to which the sort of lefty liberal urban people where else are they going to go yeah. so they don't need to try and win them over the focus is on people who live in towns particularly in the north that's where you win and basically because it's not all sort of the third lived in way because you're just if you're young you're going to pull whatever color the anti-tory lever is and in most cases that's labor yeah and lib dems are anti-building as well so if you want to get on the housing ladder you wouldn't go for them um you know i mean again the greens greens and lib dems always do well in local elections or better in local elections but that's because there's sort of a there's sort of an opportunity for people to say look i'm not terribly happy with the two main parties but when push comes to shove as you say if you're motivated more by who you don't want to get in than by who you do, then you just go for one of the two big ones. Yeah. Is it, um, I mean, thinking through you know, where does Labour go? So you know, important issues like environment, NHS, housing, but doesn't get people excited. Do the Tories probably lurch towards kind of the really nasty issues or the nasty party of immigration, culture war, the things that do get their voters excited. Um, and does that, to end on a slight pessimistic note, give us a really divisive and nasty politics in the months ahead? Uh, yeah, I mean, I am a sort of an inner optimist, so I always hope that um, it's not going to go down that route. Um, but I think, I think um, a lot will kind of depend on... Well, who who are the sort of real players within the party after the election? Um, so, Suella Braverman is kind of propped up by uh, a group called the Common Sense Group, which is um, led by a guy called John Hayes, but also has people like Bill Cash um, sort of working with her. Uh, but they are old. Uh, <laughs> old white men of a certain vintage and a certain worldview. And whenever I sort of talk about Suella and John Hayes to other conservative MPs, they kind of laugh because they're just like, they're, they, who are they? You know, John Hayes, they kind of say, is nobody. Suella's support is so overblown. She really doesn't have the backing of the party. Um, so I think that... I hate making um, predictions, but I think that probably the flirtation with the sort of culture wars and the sort of anti-immigration rhetoric um, might be kind of coming to an end. I don't. I wouldn't say it was definitely over, um, but I think they probably recognise if they want to be in power, that's not the way to do it. Um, it might be a few years before they kind of completely get over that addiction. And a very, very slight related follow-up. But on the people side, Ruth Davidson, is that a secret kind of campaign weapon for Rishi Sunak in Scotland? Maybe brings him back towards the blue wall as well in England? I mean, she's the greatest Tory, that a Scottish Tory that there, there has ever been. You know, she, um, she, she was a real loss. Um, uh, Douglas uh, Ross is just 
you know, uh, can't can't hold a candle to her. So if she were to come back and kind of campaign for them, then I think they would be very, very pleased. Um, I don't know that she's planning to do that. I mean, she's got a media career in London now. So, you know, I don't know. Um, and she's got a young family, which is the reason why she quit in the first place. So, um, but, you know, um, she, I think she found the whole Boris... Brexit era quite difficult you know a lot of a lot of particularly women but a lot of sort of centrists centrist conservatives found that whole period really unpalatable lots of death threats lots of kind of you know the whole surrender act and and all of that kind of nasty rhetoric around around people sort of the the you know the enemies of people um so perhaps with sort of the the adults in charge she might be tempted back potentially um but you know Labour probably wouldn't want that because um, you wouldn't want to campaign alongside the Conservatives as a kind of pro-union um, force because, you know, they're still quite... Without Boris, the Conservatives have more of a chance in Scotland than they did, um, but there's still a big sort of anti-Conservative feeling, I think, in, in, in Scotland. Anyone else? Flags up. Okay. All right. Thanks ever so much, everyone. Thanks for watching. To see our latest videos, head on over to our channel and don't forget to subscribe.